members of council, members of the executive management, members of Senate, our inaugurant this afternoon, Professor Johannes John Langba, family and friends of Professor John Langba, academics and professional staff, students, alumni, distinguished guests from universities and organizations within South Africa, the African continent and across the globe. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Nanapogu, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of Professor Johannes John Langba. The Vice Chancellor conveys his congratulations and best wishes to Professor Johannes John Langba. Inaugural lectures form part of the university's public lecture series and may only be presented by newly appointed full professors who have been appointed in academic schools and centers. Inaugural lectures present an opportunity for showcasing the exciting and groundbreaking research and teaching being carried out by professors in our university. Each lecture represents a significant milestone in an academic's career, providing official recognition of their promotion or appointment to full professorship. These lectures are furthermore an ideal opportunity for new professors to introduce themselves and to present an overview of their own contribution to their field to academic peers, students, and research collaborators. Inaugural lectures are also a platform for celebrating a professor's academic achievements with his or her family, friends, mentors, and colleagues. Distinguished guests, it is my pleasure to introduce the Dean and Head of the School of Applied Human Sciences, Professor Matsepo Matuane, who will now formally introduce the inaugurant, Professor Joannis John Langba. Thank you, Professor Mkise, and good afternoon to you and the inaugurant, Professor Johannes John Langba, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce our inaugurant, Professor Johannes John Langba. Professor Johannes John Langba is a full professor in the School of Applied Human Sciences in the College of Humanities at University of KwaZulu-Natal in Durban, South Africa. He received a BSc Ed degree from the University of Sierra Leone in 1990 and a Master of Social Work degree from Howard University in the United States in 2000. He also obtained the Master of Public Health and PhD degrees from the University of Pittsburgh in the United States in 2004. Professor Johannes Lang John Langba joined the Africa Population and Health Research Center as a postdoctoral research fellow in Kenya in 2004. He joined the Children's Institute in the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Cape Town in South Africa in 2006 as a child poverty program manager and then as a senior lecturer in 2007. He joined the Department of Social Development in the Faculty of Humanities at UCT as a senior lecturer in social work and social development in 2011. He then joined the School of Applied Human Sciences in the College of Humanities at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa in 2017 as an associate professor and was confirmed as full professor 
in 2022. Professor Johannes John Langba's research areas are in the social and environmental determinants of health and mental health outcomes. In particular, psychosocial functioning and well being, gender based violence and mental health, climate change and mental health, sexual and reproductive health rights, child and family well being, including child poverty, abuse, and neglect. Resilience of oppressed and vulnerable populations, migration, health and social development, social and behavioral aspects of HIV and AIDS, foster and kinship care, unpaid care work and mental health, social and behavioral aspects of antimicrobial resistance, AMR, health system strengthening, program evaluation and data ethics. He has successfully completed the supervision of 11 doctoral and 20 master students and mentored four postdoctoral research fellows. He has authored over 40 research articles in Scopus and ISI indexed journals published by reputable academic publishers such as Springler, Taylor and Francis, Elsevier, the greater in the above mentioned areas of research focus. He is currently supervising four PhD students. Professor Johannes John Langba has examined a number of master's dissertations and PhD thesis from various universities in South Africa, including the University of Pretoria, University of Witwatersrand, University of Fort Hay, University of South Africa, University of KwaZulu-Natal, University of Limpopo, University of the Western Cape, University of Johannesburg, University of Cape Town, and the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University, and the Howard University in the United States. He has also served as external assessor of senior academic promotion applications at the University of Limpopo in South Africa and the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. Professor Johannes John Langba is a member of the editorial boards of a number of national and international journals, including Social Work in Mental Health, Plus One, African Population Studies, Journal of Mental Complications and Women's Health, Journal of Cultural Analysis and Social Change, Journal of Social Work and Human Services Practice, and Social Work, Mats Kaplegewerk. He is a member of the International Advisory Board of the Journal of Ethics and Social Welfare, and has served as reviewer of a number of impact factor journals, such as Social Work in Mental Health, Men and Masculinities, African Security Review, Journal of Health Policy and Planning, Journal of Construction, Business and Management, Journal of Australian Social Work, Journal of Human Ecology, Journal of Tribes, Journal of HIV and AIDS and Social Services. He has also served as co-guest editor of a special issue of international peacekeeping. Professor Johannes John Langba has served in scientific review committees of various national and international scholarly and research entities, including the World Health Organization, Welcome in the United Kingdom, Rutledge Publishers, Laser Pulse, DART, Social Science Research Council, um, Health Systems Global, Council on Social Work Education, um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and the South African National Research Foundation. Professor Johannes John Langba has been an invited speaker at several international conferences and workshops, including in the United States, United Kingdom, Kenya, Sierra Leone, Ethiopia, and South Africa. He has had the opportunity of giving invited talks at several research and higher education institutions, such as the United University of Pittsburgh, Hubert Kuriaki University, Salzburg University, Njala University, 
Bowie State University, University of Botswana, Pan African Christian University, Robert Koch Institute, University of Pretoria, and many other universities across the globe. Professor Johannes John Langba is the recipient of a number of national and international fellowships and scholarly awards, such as the Excellence in Teaching Merit Award from the University of Cape Town in South Africa, the William H. and Carl Mill Hanks Cosby Fellowship, now called Founders Fellowship for Outstanding Scholarship and Achievement at Howard University in the United States, Population Pop Policy Communication Fellowship from the Population Reference Bureau in the United States, Rent Institute Summer Fellowship in the United States, and Africa Peace Building Research Fellowship from the Social Science Research Council in the United States, Dr. Inabel Burns Lindsay Social Work Education Leadership Award from Howard University in the United States for Outstanding Leadership in social work education and the promotion of social justice in Africa, and a certificate of recognition for distinguished contribution to blended teaching and learning during COVID-19 at UKZN. In addition to his professional work experience as an academic, Professor John Langba has extensive international development work experience, having worked for various multilateral and international non-profit organizations, including UNICEF, International Organization for Migration, Africa Health Placements, Mothers to Mothers, and APHRC. He has engaged in research and international development work in several countries, including Australia, Bangladesh, Botswana, Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, East Jerusalem, Ghana, Kenya, Lesotho, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, South Africa, Tanzania, United States, Vietnam, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Professor John Lamba is a member of the Board of Directors of the World Federation for Mental Health and serves as its current Vice President for Program Development. He served as the WFMH Africa Regional President from 2021 to 2023. He is Vice President and Mental Health Ambassador of Cape Mental Health in South Africa and serves as co-chair of the Data Ethics Working Group of the Committee on Data, CODATA, of the International Science Council. Professor John Lamba was recently recognized in the Global Top 100 list of most influential people of African descent, MIPAT, in the field of mental health at a MIPAD recognition event at the United States in New York. Allow me to now present Professor John Lamba to you. Over to you, Prof. Thank you very much, Professor Matuani, for the wonderful um, introduction. Uh, I could not have asked for more. Thank you to the University of KwaZulu-Natal for this opportunity to uh, present my inaugural lecture. Um, to all of you watching this lecture in South Africa, Sierra Leone, Kenya, and the United States, I bring you warm greetings from the University of KwaZulu-Natal in Durban, South Africa. I've singled out these four countries because these are the countries I've resided and worked in a professional capacity. Greetings to you all in attendance from around the world. Deputy Vice Chancellor and Chair, as you know, as you rightly said, professors before me have opined that inaugural lectures serve two purposes. To express gratitude to all individuals, organizations, and institutions, including the families and institutions that have contributed in one way or the other to their scholarship and careers. Secondly, the professional uh, professorial inaugural lecture offers the opportunity to profess about a societal issue or problem. I would, however, like to add a third purpose during this lecture. That is, professional uh, professorial inaugural lectures offer the opportunity to engage in evidence-based ad advocacy about a societal issue. DBC and Chair, as a point of departure, please allow me to add a few additional facts 
to my Bible sketch that the dean had so eloquently presented. The fact that I was born and raised in Sierra Leone, a small but resource, natural resource endowed country on the west coast of Africa, where being well educated was a virtue and family value. I believe the aforementioned values still hold true, notwithstanding the ongoing challenges we are currently experiencing in that country. I grew up in a small rural town called Mano, located in the Dasset Chiefdom, Moamba district in the southern province of Sierra Leone. Mano, my hometown, is strategically located about seven miles from Jala University College, one of the constituent colleges of the University of Sierra Leone, which is arguably one of the oldest institutions of higher learning in sub-Saharan Africa. So it was not accidental that I earned my undergraduate degree majoring in chemistry and biology minor from Jalai University College and was trained as a chemistry and biology teacher. Yes, my undergraduate degree was in the natural sciences and education. I know some of you in the audience may be wondering, how did he end up in the social and behavioral sciences? Well, that is a long story for another lecture. All I could say at this point is that it is usually a calling to be in the helping profession like social work. DVC and Chair, I would like to dedicate this inaugural lecture to my late parents, Mr. Jonathan Benson John Langba and Mrs. Musu Yankade John Langba. I know they are both in heaven smiling down at me as I deliver this lecture. You know, our mother Tamusu, as we fondly call her, was not privileged to receive any formal education, but guess what? She taught all of us, her five biological children, the English alphabet before we even enrolled in primary school. Our papa, we fondly call him Palangba, relentlessly instilled in all of us the value of education and always reminded us that. Because we are a big family, there is no big bank account to inherit. And that all he could offer us was good education. And indeed, good education he offered. Rest in power, Palangba and Tamusu. DVC and Chair, as I reflected on my career journey almost 20 years after earning a doctoral degree from the University of Pittsburgh in the United States, I asked myself the question, what am I gonna profess? Well, in this lecture, I would like to profess that. African countries need to engage more in replication research methods for evidence-based policy and practice if they are to accelerate achievement of the sustainable development goals, particularly those SDG targets related to addressing social and behavioral issues and problems on the African continent. DVC and Chair, it is a fact that almost all of the 17 United Nations SDG are relevant to social and behavioral issues and problems in contemporary societies. But of particular re relevance and urgency in Africa are goal one, no poverty. Goal two, no hunger. Goal three, good health and well-being. Goal four, quality education. Goal five, gender equality. Goal six, clean water and sanitation. Goal seven, affordable and clean energy. Goal number eight, decent work and economic growth. Goal number 10, reduce inequalities, just the name of you. There's no denial that there is a plethora of evidence that have been generated in Africa by Africans, and with Africans that needs to be replicated to inform evidence-based practice and policy on the African continent. I argue that as Africans, we do not need to wait for grant funding from organizations in the North to engage in proof of concept studies, when in, when in fact existing evidence could be replicated in different contexts in Africa. In this lecture, I would like to examine the rush, I would like to examine the rationale and significance of replication research approaches in the social and behavioral sciences. And some of the critical concerns related to replication methodology and its applicability in the African context, including the challenges of sameness. I will then make a case for more use of replication approaches in intervention and implement implementation science. 
So my aim in this inaugural lecture is not to teach replication research method 101, but to engage in evidence-informed advocacy for more use of replication research in the social and behavioral sciences in Africa. So what is meant by replication? Replication derives from the word, from the Latin word replicare, meaning to repeat, to unroll, to fall back. It means the repetition of a procedure, example, experiment, observation, in order to reduce errors. Replication is to seek confirmation of findings in an original study or to do something again in the same way. It also involves to generalize and expand the boundaries of an original study in order to ensure accuracy, correctness, and truth. Is truth not provisional, conjectural, foreseeable, and or what we know at a particular point in time? Well, according to the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine in 2009, Replication research could be any of the following, reproducibility, replicability, and generalizability. So the, in, in, in replication, the issue is not one of obtaining identical results, as this is usually impossible, but one of close proximity. In other words, a matter of degree rather than a yes or no binary conclusion. So a direct replication concerns a robust estimate of how big and how reliable the original studies findings were, due to the fact that the statistical analysis of the data of the original study and its replication study may be based on probabilities rather than certainties. The replication in replication research, the task is to ascertain and report on the level of similarity to the original study and its findings, as well as the degree of certainty and uncertainty in the results of both studies. So for instance, if a, re a replication study finds results that are different from those of the original study, this does not necessarily mean that the original study results were correct or incorrect. So let's consider other definitions of replication research. According to Morrison, replication research is conducting an original study again, be it using identical procedures or by making certain changes. Example, the sampling methodology in order to test the original study. Replication is the duplication of previous research in order to verify or expand the findings of the original study. But the aforementioned definitions are considered partial definitions as they are limited by validation of an original study. That is reproducibility. So what is reproducibility? Reproducibility DVC concerns how far the findings of a replication study agree with those of the original study. If the results of the original study and replicator study agree or are similar, then the results of the original study could be interpreted as being replicated. This increases the likelihood that the results of the original study are valid. So reproducibility involves reproducing the same result with the same original data when reanalyzed. So reproducibility concerns finding exact agreement between the findings of the original study and the replicated study. And if there's no agreement, the findings are not valid. But reproducibility does not guarantee that the original study was correct. Both studies could contain the same errors. And I'm, and, and I'm zeroing on reproducibility because it's a form of replication research that is widely used in data sciences these days. So I ask the question, why can't we social and behavioral scientists engage more in reproducibility studies in Africa. So I posit that there is room for its applicability in generating much needed evidence for achieving the SDG targets in Africa. Now let's consider replication as generalizability as defined by Morrison. Replication as re generalizability on the other refers to how far the results of a study apply to context settings populations and situations that differ from those of the original study. In replication as the generalizability, different methods could be used from those of the original study because the intention is not to determine how far the original concepts or concepts can apply elsewhere, regardless of whether 
the research methods used are similar or not from the original study. Having introduced replication methodology, I would now like to discuss the types of replication study that we could engage in in the social science, in social science and um, so, sorry, social and behavioral research in Africa. The first one is what is referred to as direct replication. Direct replication studies seek to replicate findings from a previous study using the same or similar as possible research methods and procedures as a previous study. So the goal of direct replication studies is to test whether the results found in the previous study are due to error or chance. This is usually done by collecting data with a new but similar sample and holding all the research methods and procedures constant. According to Chin and, and, and colleagues in 2018, direct replication is carried out to verify the results found in an original study that can be reproduced and not due to chance. It usually indicates the reliability of the original study. The next type of um, replication methodology or, or approach that we could engage in in Africa is called conceptual replication. Conceptual replication studies seek to determine whether similar results are found when certain aspects of a previous study's method or procedures are systematically varied. Conceptual replication deliberately change variables in order to ascertain how the extent to which the original study can be applied or generalized to other populations, settings, locations, conditions, settings, and context. So the aim of contextual replication is usually to ascertain if the, the original concept or phenomenon holds true despite other changes to the original study, so as to identify the boundaries of generalizability. This is what we should be doing in Africa. The third kind of replication study that we could engage in is approximate replication. This usually concerns adhering as far as possible to an exact replication, but very one or more non-central study variables, exact, for example, the confounders, whilst maintaining a close comparison between the replication and the original study. So the aim of an approximate replication study is usually to validate the original study and at the same time seek wider generalizability. Let's think about the context in Africa. In an appropriate replication study, one might change one variable at a time to see which of the variables causes the change in findings from the original study. But when we ask the question, how do we decide the kind of replication method to employ? I'll argue that to deciding the kind of replication study to conduct, either direct, conceptual, or approximate, depends on fitness for purpose. A direct replication study may be useful in instances where the original study has produced novel findings, which we will do in Africa. Conceptual replication could be used, replication could be useful where original study has already been replicated. And we're just trying to prove the concept whether it's true in other settings. Bear in mind that all replication studies must refer to an original study. It is therefore important to remember that Replication research studies are deliberate attempts to work with on an, or on a named identified original study. So DVD and Chair, at this point, I would like to make a case for more use of replication approaches in intervention and implication science for accelerating the achievement of SDGs in Africa. So let's examine, for example, my undergraduate final year research projects, my first ever research activity at Jala University College in Sierra Leone. This was an investigation into the use of local plant materials for black soap making. Black soap was uh, still an indigenous soap produced in Sierra Leone that was widely used in Sierra Leone and was believed to have um, dermatological benefits. Thanks to the high quality supervision received from the late Dr. GMT Robots, I was able to conclude in this study that the chemical properties of the widely used local plant, they not only contain potassium hydroxide, but also other chemicals that are known for their medicinal properties. So I believe this saponification process using local plant materials must have been replicated elsewhere in Africa and, and the North, because this was common in natural sciences. 
So what if I had replicated this study to gain indigenous knowledge into the other varieties of plants used for soap making in other regions of Sierra Leone, particularly with the aim of beneficiating the indigenous knowledge of soap making using local materials for poverty elevation? My second academic project was at Howard University in the United States. This was an independent study, which was a requirement for my Cosby Fellowship, now called the Founders Fellow. I conducted a study that compared African-American, Christian, and Muslim families on selected values and roles under the mentorship of Dr. Lawrence E. Gary, now Professor Emeritus of Social Work. Dr. Gary, I know you are watching this lecture from Florida. Thanks for raising the bar very high. I'm grateful for your mentorship since 1999 to date. So what did I find in this study? I found significant differences in key family values and roles between Christian Baptist and Muslim African-American families in the United States that usually impacts on family well-being and also informs decision-making processes and how these families respond to crisis and adversity. Replicate or don't replicate? I believe this should have been replicated. Now let's fast forward to my doctoral dissertation research that investigated the relationship between sexual and gender-based violence and sexual risk behaviors among refugee women at a refugee camp in Botswana and the mediating role of depression. Dr. Sandy Wexler, I believe who you are in attendance today, my doctoral research advisor, logging in from Pittsburgh in the United States. Dr. Wexler, thanks for your guidance and support. Your high academic standards have been passed down to the numerous postgraduate students I have supervised and graduated over the years. Lastly, I must say this. Thanks for being there for me when the going was tough during grad school. Okay, now back to my doctoral research study. This study was published in the Journal of World Health and Population in 2007. I found that more than half, 55% and 90% of the refugee women reported depressive symptomatology. Simultaneous multiple regression analysis further showed that a history of sexual and gender-based violence predicts sexual risk behavior among this population of refugee women in Africa. Replicate or don't replicate? My answer is yes, given the high prevalence of HS, sexual and gender-based violence in humanitarian settings in Africa, and in, even in non-humanitarian settings, especially in South Africa. Let's consider another research study that we conducted in four African countries on adolescent sexual and reproductive health in 2004, using nationally representative surveys from 12, of 12 to 19 year old girls in Burkina Faso, Ghana, Malawi, and Uganda. We examined the prevalence of sexual coercion as sexual debut among unmarried girls as well as the correlates of sexual debut. In Malawi, 38% of girls said they were not willing at their first sexual experience, followed by Ghana at 30%, Uganda at 23%, and Burkina Faso at 15%. These are the percentages of girls that said they were not willing at all during their first sexual encounter. We provided research and policy implications of the findings and concluded that one way to address youth sexual health is through providing sexual education that specifically addresses consent and coercion. We concluded that traditional HIV programs which emphasize abstinence, faithfulness in relationships, and condom use do not protect young girls from HIV in un unwanted sexual situations as condoms are rarely used when the sex is coerced. Unfortunately, we found that sexual education at that time for youth rarely discuss sexual coercion. They don't. We also concluded that rather than limiting sex, sex education to promoting abstinence, other, other topics that need to be included are preventing sexual coercion, providing support to victims who experience unwanted and most likely unprotected sexual intercourse. Strengthen the legal and advocacy environment for young women to raise awareness about recourse against those who may coerce them in unwanted sexual activities. 
We need to train providers and educate young women about their rights, including addressing gender norms and teaching communication and negotiation skills. This was in 2007. Some of the research that has been going on, we had the evidence. Do we replicate and don't replicate in other African countries? Absolutely, yes, we should have replicated these studies instead of waiting for funding from the North. We eventually published these findings in 2007 with myself and more Kofi, Asari, Nyubani Modise, and, 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 and Kumi Keremeri as authors in the African Journal of Reproductive Health. In summary, DBC, there is a strong case for application studies in social and behavioral research in Africa. Its current use in the social and behavioral sciences in Africa is reportedly limited. There must be a change of mindset that moves away from the thinking that single studies, regardless of size, are sufficient to inform policy and practice. Replication research can overcome the danger of relying on a single study to inform development of policies and interventions and practice. For instance, Matthew and colleagues in 2018 noted that in education, unreplicated research does not even meet the minimum requirement for contributing to nuanced evidence-based informed practice in education. A number of other scholars, including Frank and Sachs in 2018, have noted that there seems to be a widespread agreement on the significance of replication studies but there is no clear consensus on how to engage them. So I, I, I would argue that various stakeholders must be involved in promoting replication studies in the social and behavioral sciences in Africa, including national and local government, professional societies and associations, journal editors, funders, researchers, research training institutions, of course, higher education institutions. Higher, uh, higher education institutions must hold a positive attitude towards replication studies for promotion of academics and for career advancement. I argue that replication studies hold huge promise in the evidence-informed agenda for achieving the SDGs in Africa. It is my hope that this inaugural lecture is a step in that direction. DBC and Chair, at this juncture, I would like to express my gratitude to my family to family, individuals, and institutions for their contribution and support to my academic career. First and foremost, I would like to thank my wonderful family, my wife, Dr. Vivian Nasaka John Langa, my son, Muke Limayan, and daughter, Musu Nasirian Awa. Thank you for your unconditional love, encouragement, understanding, and support. Dr. Vivian, Thanks for unconditionally placing your hold, a hold on your academic pursuit and career for over a decade to be a mother and wife. I could not have achieved this academic rank without you. You are very special. Muke, thanks for your understanding during your early childhood years, when we moved from one country to the next in my pursuit of a socially just working environment. Thanks for your understanding, Muke. Musu, Thanks for being the highly resilient child that you are. Oh, a special thank you for baking a decadent Malvan pudding today for dessert this evening. Next, I would like to thank all my siblings, nephews, nieces, and other extended family members. Thank you all for your support and encouragement over the years. I would particularly like to express my profound gratitude to my elder sister. Evelyn Hawa John Langba. Hawa, thank you for your unflinching support and belief in me. You are truly one of a kind. I would like to thank all of my friends at home and abroad. You know who you are. Thanks for the friendship and thanks for your support. To my Pittsburgh family, Dr. Teresa Kajagi, Dr. Sandy Wexler, Professor Andre Stevenson, Professor Tirello Moroka, Dr. Sonia Gilkey, Professor Frederick Kajagi, Professor Sandy Mompa, Professor Michael Lindsay, and Mr. Karuna Kajagi. 
Thank you all for your guidance, friendship, support, and encouragement, not only in Pittsburgh, but post Pittsburgh years. Over two decades of friendship and support, to be precise. So all the colleagues I've worked with in Sierra Leone, South Africa, Kenya, United States, and around the world. Thanks for the privilege of getting to know and work with you. Last but not the least, I would like to thank the University of KwaZulu-Natal, UKZN, for all the academic support and providing a conducive academic environment for me to grow. UKZN is truly a university for nurturing African scholarship. Thanks ever so much, Professor Mikizi, for all your support and encouragement during the last five years. I would particularly like to thank the Dean, Professor Matuani, and my colleagues in the School of Applied Human Sciences and the Discipline of Social Work. Thanks ever so much for the collegiality and support. I would like to particularly thank Ms. Babalu Adano for, your, for her unflinching support. Last but not the least, I would like to acknowledge the contributions of the postgraduate students I have supervised or successfully supervised to graduation. To the over 20 master students, thanks for the privilege to supervise you and get to know you. Ms. Ritasha Sukdu, thanks for the privilege of supervising your application study recently at the master's level. To the diverse PhD students I've graduated, your contributions to my scholarship are noteworthy, and I must name you. Dr. P. Lafemile, Black, South African, female. Dr. Sandile Ludlu, Black, South African, male. Dr. Kwanele Shishani, Black, South African, female. Dr. Antantu, Black, Cameroonian, and female. Dr. Fumari Jumari, Black, Nigerian, female. Dr. Gary Jones, White, Australian, male. Dr. Ingrid Daniels, Colored, South African, female. Dr. Deidre Rude, Colored, South African female. Dr. Tolbert Mucheri, Black, Zimbabwean male. Dr. Tanya Robinson, White, South African female. Thank you all for your contributions to my scholarship. To all of you watching from across the world, Thanks for the privilege of your time. Hats off to all of you. Peace. Thank you, DBC. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor John Nangpa, thank you very much. Uh, in a way, you have uh, delivered your own vote of thanks, so I will be highlighting some of the key issues that you touched on today and uh, emphasize the sincerest gratitude uh, that we have to all the people who have participated uh, in uh, nurturing uh, your development. Ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that Professor John Langba's inaugural lecture touches on some of the most important issues affecting higher education uh, globally, particularly in the field of uh, research and uh, research training, quality training. In the 21st century, we are bombarded with tons of information. Hence, it is important that our students and researchers are equipped with both the advanced quantitative and qualitative tools to make sense of this information in order to contribute to social, economic, and other innovations. You have highlighted the need 
to acknowledge the role that can be played by replication designs, especially in intervention studies in mental health, gender-based violence, etc. It is evident through your inaugural lecture today that you are a shining example of interdisciplinary scholarship that combines both the STEM and humanities in the tradition that was established by one of our African luminaries, Shai Panta Dio. So congratulations for uh, emphasizing this dimension of our training. I also want to highlight the major contribution that you have made in the college, particularly at the postgraduate or graduate training. We have traveled a long way with you uh, since the establishment of the Doctoral Academy of which you are the director, founded in 2019, which is meant to highlight the quality of doctoral training and postgraduate training in general at the University of KwaZulu Natal. And I want to openly express our sincerest appreciation for the role that you have uh, played uh, in that regard. Throughout your career at UKZN, you have emphasized the need for students to be well equipped to, to conduct their studies using complex quantitative experimental research designs if social interventions are to make a meaningful uh, contribution to policy on the African continent. We also wish to acknowledge your persistent efforts to embed internationalization in everything that we do. And it is largely thanks to your efforts that the Humanities Doctoral Academy of which you are the director has sourced professors for globe and continent, but Europe and the Americas as well. Personally, also, I have known you as a family man. On many occasions, when I've tried to reach out to you, you have said, I'm on my way to fetch my son from school. We appreciate that dimension of your life, and we are grateful to your family for giving you the space to share your creative contributions with us. Delegates from near and far, within UKZN, the province, the country, the continent, and globally have attended this lecture today. Thank you all for co-celebrating Professor John Dangpa's successes with us. I would like to thank your colleagues in the School of Applied Human Sciences, Professor Matwane and all of them, your international colleagues who continue to support you and through you, the school and the University of KwaZulu-Natal. To all of you attending this lecture today, we thank you. It is with the impeccable professional support that we have received from the registrar's team, ably led by Dr. Cleland, and the corporate relations team, ably led by Ms. Norma Zondo, that we have been able to present this lecture successfully today. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. With those words, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all and may you go in peace. Thank you, Prof.